And we are in the year of expansion, multiplication, and increase. Amen? And everything that we do or say will be geared along those lines, but there are certain truths that we've got to keep in our spirit. And no matter what year, no matter what God is doing, we've got to go back and look at these things. I say go back, maybe, maybe you're looking at them for the first time. But to understand... Uh, position and calling, amen, that are on our lives. Now we're going to talk tonight, I'm going, to, I'm going to preach specifically, teach specifically on the subject of being predestined, predestination, predestined. And uh, we're going to deal with election and calling and uh, those things that were done in eternity past. And maybe you've, you've thought about that, maybe you haven't heard a lot about it, but we're going to look at these things because because when I understand that I was predestined after I was born again for certain things, certain paths that I should walk in, then I'll push toward that. Amen. Amen. And, and the, the subject of predestination, the subject of calling and election, it gets a bad name because of, of, of people that take it too far. They talk about the sovereignty of God and that everything is, God is sovereign and if it happens, it must be God's will. Well, that's number one, that's wrong. All right, God is sovereign, but it just simply means He's above all. He's above all in power. But we're going to deal tonight specifically with this subject. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. And notice what it says. For whom He... God did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. Now understand this. Predestination is based on God's foreknowledge. Predestination is based on God's foreknowledge, what God foreknew. All right? Predestination, it's not happenstance, it's not chance. It was based on God's foreknowledge. Now, sinners do not have a calling. There's no sinner that you know in the state that they're in that has a destiny. People will say, well, God's got a destiny for everybody. Let me explain. God does have a destiny for everybody. Everybody is not going to make the choice that brings them into God's destiny. So a sinner, a non-believer, has no destiny. They have no future. Because they don't have the one in their life that can give them a future. Do you understand? We do. We have a destiny. We have a calling. Why? It's based on God's foreknowledge. Are you following me? So predestination is God's foreknowledge of the choices that I will make. Predestination is God's foreknowledge of the choices that I'm going to make. In other words, when I got born again, I have been called. I have been justified. Amen. I've not been glorified yet, but God considers it a done deal. In God's mind, I'm glorified. I don't see it yet, but in God's mind, it's a done deal. Why? It's based on the choice I made. When I got born again, I received my calling. When I got born again, I received my justification. When I got born again, in God's mind, I received my glorification. And I may not see it in my life, in my body right now, but in God's mind, it's a done deal. Amen. So say out loud, I am called. I am, called. I am justified. I am justified. And, in God's mind, and in God's mind, I'm glorified. I'm glorified. Hallelujah. Do you see that? See, at eight years old, God saw me get saved. And based on my decision to get saved, He called me. You understand? Based on your decision, when you got born again, 
based on your decision, God called you. He gave you your calling then. I'll say it again. When you got born again, based on your decision, God gave you your calling. Amen. Do you see that? Because God sent out invitations from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time, God's been sending out invitations to His family. And when I accepted Jesus, I RSVP'd. When I accepted Jesus, I reserved my place in that calling. Came into my destiny. Came into my eternity. Amen. Now look at John chapter 3. Because notice what Jesus says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is important in understanding my calling and my election. Because it, it goes a long way in what I'm going to do for God. Amen. If, if, listen, if your if you're positional... If positional truth is not real in your life, for instance, the book of Colossians chapter 2 says you are complete in Him. That, that word in the Greek means you'll never be any more gods than you are right now. I can't be any more gods than I am now, than I was when I got saved. Every man in here, you will never be more male than you are. Every woman, you'll never be more female than you are. That is positional truth. I will never be any more gods than I am right now. You understand? I'm growing in Him, but I'm complete in Him. I belong to Him completely. I am His completely. I'm complete in Him. I'll never be any more saved than I am right now. I will never be any more righteous than I am right now. Why? My spirit is wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. My spirit has never known anything evil. My spirit has never known anything sinful or wrong or, or, or dirty. My spirit is the spirit that is of God. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 1 that Jesus was the one that would light every spirit that came into the world. In the book of Hebrews, it says that God is the Father of all spirits. So when you got born again, you didn't get a slightly tainted spirit. You got a brand new spirit that came out of the heart and the bosom of God Himself. And so when you were born again, positionally, you became all gods. Amen. Do you understand? You'll never be any more His than you are. And positional truth has to be what I base my life on. There are people that will not receive the year of expansion, multiplication, and increase because they do not understand the position of who they are in Christ. Do you understand? It's, listen, uh, and I taught some on this in, in, in Bible doctrine, but I'm going to say it again. In Colossians chapter 2, again, it talks about that you were, you were circumcised, and then it says, not with the circumcision made of hands, but in the putting off of the body of death. You understand? And when it says, not with the circumcision made of hands, it means hands, natural human hands, had nothing to do with what happened to you. It was all grace. You understand? Didn't have anything to do with it. So that means this. That means that your election was not based on your merit, it was based on your decision. Your election was not based on your goodness, it was based on your decision. Because when you made the decision, there was nothing good in you. When you made the decision, you didn't merit anything. But when you made that decision, glory to God, the one that did merit everything, the one that was good completely, became your advocate and He took you to the Father and on the basis of His goodness, on the basis of His merit, on the basis of who He was, God brought you into this thing. Glory to God. Woo! Amen. And then He forgot everything you were. 
I need you to understand that. When you understand positional truth, amen, then you understand what I'm called to. Because the enemy will try to, he will try to uh, mimic the voice of God. He'll try to impersonate God's voice. And there'll be people that'll come and they'll talk to you and they'll say, you know, I just, I, I really feel like, you know, this isn't happening for me because of what I did. Wait a minute, hang on, let me help you tonight. I'm going to help you, okay? Did you ask God to forgive you of that? I'll ask them, or you can ask them. And they'll say, yes, okay, then listen to me. God does not ever, ever bring up what he forgave. Why? Because in His Word, which is truth. Amen. See, positional truth cannot be changed. It cannot be changed by God. It cannot be changed by the devil. It cannot be changed by demons. And it cannot be changed by you. It can be not received by you, but it can't be changed. God cannot change this. Now, He doesn't want to. I'm saying that for emphasis. So my place, my standing, my election, my predestination, my foreordination is a done deal. And nobody can change it. God doesn't bring up your past as a reason why you're not having whatever you need now. That's the devil trying to impersonate God's voice. And you need to remind him of who you are in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I've been justified. I've been sanctified. I've been called by God. Amen. Amen. Do you understand that? Did you find John chapter 3? Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So notice two things here. Sinners are not predestined for hell. They go there through their choices. Right? Because he says right here, he that believeth on him is not condemned. How many believed on him? Guess what? You're not condemned. Do, do you know your position with Christ has eternal implications in this? That there is therefore now no. You could say it this way. There is therefore now no and there will never be any condemnation. It's an eternal implication. So that means when I stand before God, there'll be no condemnation. That's why you hear people, they'll say, well, when you stand before God, your life is going to be played. No, it's not. Because that life doesn't exist. Now think about that for a minute. See, don't get your theology from a movie. Get it from the Bible. There's not one scripture... In the Bible that says when the believer stands before God, that they're going to play a review of his life. Nope. Do you understand? I stand before the judgment. This is beautiful. I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to stand before the one that took my place. I'm going to stand before the one that loved me so much he gave himself for me. My Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So there's none now, and there never will be any. That's why Paul wrote in the book of Romans, and he said, who are you to condemn me? Now, now listen, he wasn't being cocky. He was saying, Christ died. Yea, rather is risen again. God justified me. You understand? So there's no condemnation from God. And if there's no condemnation from God, 
Who can condemn me? If God be for me, who can be against me? See, that's the importance of knowing positional truth. And that's why you've got to go over that on a regular basis. You've got to go over on a regular basis who you are in Christ. Reminding yourself what you have in Christ, who you are in Christ, what belongs to you. Because it's positional truth. Do you understand? So grace is this. Grace is God providing all I will ever need. Tell your neighbor, grace, grace. provided all provided. that I will ever need. Faith is me reaching out to take it. You've provided it all, now I'm taking it. There are people in the sound of my voice right now tonight. Here's the problem you have, is every time you start to move to a higher level in God, shame shows up. Where you're not in a position of shame. You're in a position of no past. How can you be ashamed of what never occurred? But it did occur. See, you don't have your position right. When did it occur? Well, back there, you know, back there then before I got saved. Oh, you mean that guy that's dead? That woman that's dead? That woman that doesn't exist anymore? See, you can't, you can't live a life in Christ and a life in the flesh. You can't do that. The old man died, is buried, does not exist anymore. And I have been risen to a new life in Christ. Isn't that what Romans chapter 6 says? It says if we were crucified with Him and buried with Him, we should also walk in newness of life. Am I helping you at all? Glory to God. So grace is God providing all that I will ever need. So there's nothing that I will ever need that grace doesn't provide me. Faith is me reaching out to take it. Now look at Isaiah 42. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Every challenge... That a Christian face, that a Christian faces, is either overcome or lost by how they see themselves. Think C B. Remember, I was talking today. If you see yourself seated with Christ, if you see yourself in the seat of the overcomer, if you see yourself conferred with authority from God Himself in Ephesians chapter 2, where He said He seated us together with Christ, if you see yourself that way, then you're going to act that way. If your foundation is shaky on positional truth, who you are in Christ, then every area of my life is going to be shaky. Amen. Do you understand? You Listen, what you do is not who you are. I need you to see that. What you do is not who you are. Now, because of the way we talk about ourselves, it becomes that way in our language. Uh, you know, you go up to a guy that works construction. What do you do? I'm a construction worker. Now, wait a minute. I asked you what you did. I didn't ask you who you were. I said, what do you do? And you said, I'm a construction worker. That's not what I asked. You told me who you were. I asked you what you did. I work construction. But, Pastor, why, why, why is that so... Why is that so important? Because here, here's the issue. If you're struggling with something and somebody comes up and says, hey, what do you do? I'm a sinner. I'm a loser. Well, ask what we do, but we answer with who we are. Do you understand that? Positional truth moves me over here. It's not what I do, it's who I am. Yeah, but what if I sin? Well, now hang on a second. Wait a minute. Your sin, Jesus said, your sin cannot change your standing.
Lost my crowd. <laughs> it can't. Yeah, but you know, Pastor, that's just giving people the right to go sin all they want. No, it's not. I'm trying to explain something to you. If every time you miss the mark, you start seeing yourself as a mark misser, that's what you're going to keep doing. Because you do what you see yourself as. You can't avoid that. But if you see yourself positionally where you're supposed to be, in Christ, far above all principality, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, free, Romans chapter 6, from the dominion of sin. Romans chapter 6 says, He that is dead is freed from sin. Sin shall therefore not have dominion over you. Why? You're not under the law. You're under grace. Law produced no position in people's life. It gave them a list of what not to do and no power to achieve it. When you were moved into Christ, the reason why that no longer has any bearing on your life is I came into the position of the one that perfectly kept the law. It's not up to me to keep it. It's not up to me to make things things work, I am now engrafted, put positionally in the one who did it all. Amen. That's part and parcel of redemption. Amen. But aren't you afraid people are going to want to go sin? No. Because what I'm telling you right now is the power over it. I said what I'm telling you right now is the power over it. So when someone says, you know, what do you do? Well, I work construction, but I am a preacher. I work over here, but I'm a pastor. I work over here, but I'm called to do this. Do you understand why that's important? So Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, notice, my elect. In whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now this is talking about Jesus, but I need you to understand something. We share the election of Jesus Christ. When I was born again, Jesus was the elect. I came into the elect. Paul said we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So I had no election until I became in Christed. When I became in Christ, I received my election because I entered into the elect. There was no person righteous until they entered into Christ. And when they entered into Christ and partook of His righteousness, then they became the righteousness of God in Christ. No righteous man until Jesus came on the earth. Yeah, but the Bible talks about righteous lot and righteous people. No, no, here's, here's what it means. It means that those people feared God. Not righteous in a new covenant sense. Righteous in a new covenant sense means I am in Christ and I am positionally and practically righteous. The Bible makes no distinction. People will say, well, are we positionally righteous or practically righteous? That's not, that's, not a, that's not a valid question because Paul never made a difference. If your position is in Christ, then you are positionally and practically righteous. Now listen to me. And as long as you choose to stay there, that can never change. That can never change. Jesus said, no man can pluck you out of my hand. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So what's that do for that old religious doctrine that says God will get tired of that and just wash his hands of you? Uh, he said he'd never leave you and never forsake you. You can't have it both ways. Amen. Oh, I'm helping you tonight. Election is based on the foundation of foreknowledge. And we'll talk about this. What God foreknew. My election is based on that. Now, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6. Are you receiving anything? Yes. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6. Now notice. 
For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now that seems a little vague. Now watch, what's he talking about? Well, verse 18 of chapter 3 is what he's talking about. For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which, by the Spirit, by which also he went and, notice what it says, preached unto the spirits in prison. The Old Testament saints, those that died under the Old Covenant. Hallelujah. And he says, the gospel was preached to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, that live according to God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. We share the election of Jesus Christ. And it's based on the foundation of foreknowledge. God knew what decision these people in Abraham's bosom were going to make. And based on their decision to live the righteous life that they knew to live before the Messiah came, before Jesus Christ came, based on the decision to follow God, amen, they were kept in Abraham's bosom. And based on that foreknowledge, God went and had Jesus minister to them the gospel of Jesus Christ so they could see the one that was prophesied to come. Sarah saw him, Abraham saw him, Isaac saw him, all the Old Testament saints saw him and it was based on God's foreknowledge. Based on their decision. And they entered into that election. Oh my God. Now, look at Ephesians 1.4. See, this is important because your life is not a series of coincidences. Especially after you get born again. Before you got born again, you might have lucked into some things. But after you got born again, it's no longer a coincidence what's going on in your life. It is a prearranged, preordained plan of God. And if I'm willing to follow His plan, oh my goodness, life can be real good. Amen? Ephesians 1, 4, notice what it says. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So we were chosen as Jesus was by virtue of being in Him. See, you've got to understand something. When you became in Christed, God, when you got born again, God always saw you there. Now, let me explain what I mean. He's never, in, in, in the mind of God, when you got born again, He's never known a day that you weren't born again. I'll say it again. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So before the foundation of the world, the invitation went out. The, the notification that God wanted to choose us went out. When I received that invitation and became in Christed, it was like I had always been there. I just took my place. Okay, you need visual aids. Come here, Johnny. Uh, let me see who else I got here. Just give me two or three brothers. Come up here. Hallelujah. Come on, Anthony. Hallelujah. Come on, Daryl. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all stand. Stand right here. Stand shoulder to shoulder. All right? Amen. Uh, where's somebody else? Uh, Glory. Come here, young man. You want to be a preacher? Amen. Now stand, stand right here. Stand right here. Stand right here. Yeah, right, right, right here. Okay. Good job. <laughs> now, understand this. So here, here, is, here is those that are in Christ. They're born again. They're in Christ. I'm over here. I'm not in Christ. The invitation goes out. Right? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, begins to draw me. I receive that invitation. 
You understand? I get my life right. I get born again. I become in Christed. Here's what happened. There was already a place, and I just took my place. And in God's mind, I had always been there. So he didn't go down the line and go, Woo, doggy, glad you finally showed up. I've, I've always been there. I was chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Because the invitation was going out before the world ever was. God was always calling to people. And when I received the invitation, I just took my place. You just took your place. And everything was already ready. Everything was already prepared. My calling, my election, my paths that I should walk in, my life, my family, my church, my ministry, everything was already there. Glory to God. Thank you, guys. Praise God. Do do you see that? So I'm not trying... To get God to do something, it's taking my place and just walking in what He's already done. Because the person wasn't predestined. The way was predestined. The way was predestined. Jesus is the way. The way to what? Well, the the way, the truth, the life. But the way to your, your calling. The way to your election. The way to your ministry. Jesus is the way. Hallelujah. And so for every person on this people planet, there's an invitation that goes out. And there's a spot reserved. There will be people that will disregard the invitation. And so whatever was there for them to do, they won't do it. And God's not mad. God's not upset with them. God's grieved. It hurts God that people don't receive His invitation. Uh, the Bible says God's angry at the sinner every day. Wait a minute, hang on. Number one, that's under the law. Do you, see, these are doctrinal things. You do realize under the law, God's wrath wasn't satisfied. I mean, you understand that. That under the law, every sinner was walking with the potential of death over their head every day. Right? That's what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says. It says, Because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same, so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who all their lifetime were subject to the fear of death. So all their lifetime they walked subject to the fear of death. Amen. Amen. Under the new covenant, God's anger has been appeased. Has it or has it not? Now listen, you can't have it both ways. You can't have an angry, mean God under the new covenant. You really can't have an angry, mean God under the old covenant. The only people that were judged under the old covenant were disobedient people that wouldn't do what God told them to do. Y'all are looking at me like a dog at a new dish. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 you understand? But under the new covenant, glory to God, the invitations are going out. They, they keep going out. Now, if I take it and take up my place, I walk into everything He has for me. Amen. Because that's, my, that's based on the foreknowledge of God. Amen. Now, look at uh, 1 Peter Chapter 1. Are you receiving? I'm receiving. I always, I guess it's just the pastor in me. I always want to caution people. But I mean, I believe you're smart enough to understand this. Nobody's, nobody's telling you you can go live however you want and God's okay with that. That's not what I'm saying. What, but what I'm saying is if you make a mistake, and guess what? I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You're going to. If you make a mistake, if you slip, whether it's an action or a thought or whatever it is, I need you to understand something. That doesn't, that doesn't abdicate your place. It doesn't change your election. It doesn't change the foreknowledge of God. It doesn't change. You don't have to get born again again. Because you can only be born again once. My God. Isn't that good? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The Father, 
through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So God elected me based on the fact that I made the decision to give my life to Him. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Now people will ask, well, Pastor, doesn't God know who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved? Well, He's God. But that doesn't stop Him from sending the invitation out. Any, any person that stands before God that did not receive Jesus will not stand there without a record of the invitations that were sent to them. See, because, because, because they never took their place in Christ. So their past was never removed. It exists. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, well, actually in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, it talks about the books, books that God keeps. Well, why? Because before you got born again, everything you did was written down. Everything. I mean, some of y'all had books. I mean, I, I, I'm talking volumes. Amen. Maybe me chief among you. Hallelujah. But, the book of Revelation says something. Amen. It says... That now that I'm in Christ, there's only one book. The book of life. Now that's a blessing. Because the non-born again person will stand before God and the question will be, it says in the book of Revelation, that the books will be opened. All their books will be opened. And then the question will be asked, Oh, and is his name found in the book of life? And if it's not, then that person goes into eternal separation from God, eternal punishment. But they didn't go without an invitation. Part of the punishment of hell will be knowing that God dealt with me over and over and over and over and over again and I resisted it and that I am in that place of eternal punishment because I chose to go there. Amen. That, that'll be part of it. But then there will be those of us that go to eternal splendor with God and here's the key. Here's the key to this. And it will be like we always were supposed to be there. Why? We don't have a past. I don't have a past. Heaven's my home. It's not a reward where I'm going. It's where I'm from. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, if, if you ask Pastor Marty Cadell, if you ask him, if you said, where is home? Now, he might say DeSoto, Kansas. But if you ask him, where are you from? Heaven. And you're from El Salvador naturally, right? So if you said, where are you from naturally? He would say, El Salvador. He wouldn't say DeSoto because that's not where he's from. That's where he's at now, but that's not where he's from. But spiritually, where are you from? Heaven. I'm from heaven. That's where I originated from. Wow. Amen. So when, when cessation of life occurs in this body, amen, you understand? It's the sting of death has been removed. The taste of death has been removed. Paul called it sleep. Amen. Glory to God. So my eyes just close on this side and my eyes open on the other side. And I don't open my eyes and go, golly, I'm there, I'm home. I'm, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be there. I, I know where things are. See, I, I, I can't believe it any other way. Because that's where I originated. Do you understand? So God elected me based on the fact that I made the decision to give my life to Him. 
Whenever you were saved. Now, Pastor, I've only been saved a year. I've only been saved two years. It doesn't matter. In the mind of God, you've been saved forever. Why? Because everything God does is an eternal work. Have, have you ever... Oh, my God. Lord, help me preach this right. Have, have, have you ever noticed this? And sometimes we don't understand this. Have you ever noticed that somebody will get born again and they'll begin what we call living for God and it seems like things start being given back to them? You know what all those things were? What was theirs already? They just got in their place and it could flow to them. But when you were in the world and you, and, you were, and you were doing all the things you were doing, there's no way for that plan to flow into your life because you're not in your place. You were walking somewhere you shouldn't have been walking. But when you received the invitation and you took it and you gave your life to Christ and you took your place, everything opened up. And that's why life is so good. And that's why it was so easy to be delivered. And that's why it was so easy to get your finances turned around. And that's why it was so easy to get your marriage back and get your family back and get everything back. Why? Because you took your place and all the... Listen, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, that when you got born again, you begin taking paths that were foreordained that you should walk in, living the good life. Shh. That's shouting ground right there. Amen. Do you understand? And so I can expect expansion, multiplication, and increase because of where I am, because of whose I am, and what belongs to me. Glory, 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 glory. Mm, 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 mm. Well, they say that's finger licking good. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God, 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 glory to God. And there's nothing the enemy can do about that. My place is not based on what he thinks. My place is not based on what people think. My place was reserved for being my, my daddy in heaven. And he sent me a personalized invitation covered in the blood of the Lamb, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And he gave it to me and asked me and requested my presence in his life. He chose me. He wanted me to be his child. He wanted me to belong to him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He wanted me to be his. And when I took my place, everything started flowing. And that's why you don't believe religion. You don't believe religion that says it's a hard old way. You don't believe what religion said that after six months the new will wear off. Baby, let me tell you something. After six months, I'm not even started good. Amen. I'm telling you, if you've, if you've only, listen, it doesn't matter how long you've been born again. If you've been born again 50 years, what's 50 years in eternity? You're just getting, you're, you're not even, listen, you're not even, you're not even out of the womb yet. You're not, you're, you're not even sucking your thumb yet, been saved 50 years. You're not even off the binky yet. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. But the, oh, but the Bible says there's coming a day when I will be known as I am known. In other words, I will know myself the way God knows me. I'll see myself the way God sees me. And the Bible says it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. I know that. What does that mean? I will be found in Christed. I will be found in my place. I will be found elected by God from the foundation of the world. See, now I tried not to holler. I, I, but it's impossible. Amen. When I start talking about what God did for us before the foundation of the world, it brings something alive in us. Whew. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm nearly done. Now that's where you go. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hadn't it been a great resurrection day? I'm so excited. 
I'm excited about the life in this fellowship. I'm excited about the life in the Juarez's church. I'm so excited to see a vibrant living body. I'm, I'm so excited that you're getting a hold of who you are in Christ. I'm so excited that you're seeing the worth and the dignity that God has placed on your life. I'm telling you, if you're in here and you're called to preach, I need you to understand something. There is no greater dignity that God could bestow upon anybody than to ask them to share this ever-living gospel. There's no greater dignity that God could confer upon us. But beyond that, there's no greater honor that God could confer on anybody than to ask them to be His child. And He asked you to be His. He chose you. Oh my God, He chose me. That'll run the devil off. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You ready? You brought your shouting clothes? Yeah. For by grace are you saved through faith. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that grace is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Yeah. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now you understand this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm not saved by good works. I'm saved to good works. Not saved by them, saved to them. Amen. We're not trying to attain some higher level of consciousness. Like false religions. We're not trying to do good so we can obtain a different standing with God. We do good because good's in us. We do the right thing because the right thing's in us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Only the grace of God can save us. Because that is the basis of what we call unmerited favor. You didn't deserve salvation. But don't focus on that. Because now you're deserving. Because now I'm in Christ. See, Jesus did deserve it because He never sinned. He perfectly pleased the Father. Now I'm looking at you and understand what I'm saying here. The new you never sinned in the mind of God. If I do fail, if I do miss the mark, Lord, I repent immediately. It's forgotten. Not, listen, not covered. Not just put in the back of his mind. Forgotten. I'm forgotten. Let me tell you something. The God who can remember anything, if he chooses to forget something, it's forgotten. And you know why he forgets it? Because he chose to. You know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He chose to. He chose to forget it. My Lord. Let's, let's look at Romans 4. I got one, one verse after this. Are you receiving? Do you see why understanding my, my position, positional truth, is so important? Because this takes the question about predestination, foreknowledge, election. takes it out of the equation. I was, I was foreordained. I was pre-elected by God in Christ. In other words, a place was made for me before the foundation of the world. Then the invitation started going out. Amen. That was predestination by the foreknowledge of God. Now, every person in, the, in this people planet has a predestination by God. He's sending out invitations to everyone. The problem is some people won't receive them. But everybody has a place. That's why Jesus said, He said, narrows the gate, straights the way that leads to life. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and many, many will enter therein. Now, I've, I've heard people try to make that this and that, and that there's so many more that were going to be lost and saved. I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that for one second. I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe there's going to be more people lost than saved. Why? Then that would mean the power of sin is greater than the power of God. There's going to be people that, that, that die in their sin because people have a choice and God won't violate their free will. But every day, listen, I'm telling you, the people in your life that you love that are not living for God right now, every day the invitation's coming into their life. 
Every day, the Holy Spirit is dealing with them. Every day, you need to pray over them all the time that right now, the ministering spirits are setting events in motion whereby my loved ones will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you that laborers are being sent into the harvest right now on their job, in their school, at their home, at the gym, wherever they go, in the grocery store. God, send somebody to give my child, my cousin, my sister, my brother an invitation. To the kingdom. Woo! Because they got a place. And I'm going to see them all there. How about you? Yes. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. What, what shall we say then that Abraham our father has found pertaining to the flesh? What has he found? If Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now notice what it says. What saith the scripture? Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Notice what it says. This is important. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If I can work for it, then I'm in debt. You're not in debt for a gift. Now I'm going to say something that will go counterclockwise to some people's theological upbringing. And that's okay. That's a sacred cow that we need to kick over. Alright? I need you to understand. And here's what I need you to understand. People will say this. We'll even sing, set, sing songs about owing debts that we can never pay to God. Where's that at in the Bible? Show me where it says that God is holding a debt against me for His gift. Now, I'm not minimizing it. I'm not minimizing your, your, what should be your desire to love and serve God because of what He did for you. But you're doing it out of love, not out of an outstanding debt. It was a gift that somebody else paid the debt for. Oh, it cost somebody his life. And that's why it should make you want to serve God to your utmost. But he's not holding it over your head. After all, I sent my son to die for you. You ought to want to serve me. Well, now, wait a minute. How's, how would that work? He said, if you do it based on debt, then you got a problem. Let, let me explain this. When you received Christ, all debts were canceled. I don't owe anything. And that's why the enemy wants to come and get you working harder and get you working based on debt and get you working based on what you can do to make yourself feel better about who you are. That will work for a while, but it won't work long term. Amen. Do you see that? Only the grace of God. Say out loud. Only the grace of God can save us. Now, last scripture. James chapter 2. Now, I'm going to suggest this. If, uh, is anybody in here you watch YouTube very much? You watch YouTube? If you watch YouTube, uh, Victory Television Network has a YouTube channel. And Pastor Caldwell has been preaching, teaching on Arkansas uh, Alive for the last... Uh, well, the last two weeks, on law versus grace. And I'm telling you what, he's got the most sound teaching on law versus grace of anybody I've ever heard. And I encourage you to get on there and watch that. I don't encourage you to watch a lot of people, but I will always encourage you to watch him. And it's just 28 minutes, 28 minutes and 32 seconds uh, of, of the television show. But he takes and, and he goes through law versus grace. Now, in actuality... You and I as believers, Gentile believers, if that's what you want to call us, we were never under law. We came into this thing under grace. The law had to be taught to us. Somebody had to teach you to be legalistic. Because when you got born again, you felt freedom. Whew. But then somebody started teaching you how rough it was going to be. 
Somebody started teaching you how hard this Christian life was going to be. Right? Somebody started teaching you what you had to do. Well, listen, I'm just a Jesus preacher, and here's what I'm going to tell you what you have to do. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Romans chapter 13, Paul said, loving your neighbor was the fulfilling of the law. Well, how do I do that? With the love of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us by Him. Amen. Amen. So I can love and love and love and love and love and love and love because there's a constant inflowing of the love of God into my spirit. It never runs out. It never runs thin. It never runs, it never runs empty. It's always there. It's always accessible to me. I keep myself in my place. I keep myself where the blessings of God are flowing in my life. Amen? I'm going to encourage you to rest in what Christ has done. Amen? Amen. The last scripture, James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and has not works? Can faith save him? Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to say James goes through this and talks about how faith coupled with works produced benefits. And we'll see a couple of these. Notice what it says. Uh, in uh, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Amen. Then he talks in here about Rahab the harlot and different people. But here's what I want to get to. Abraham was justified by works when he offered Isaac. By faith. Rahab was justified by when she received the two spies. Now here's the point I wanted to get to. Works were the outward display of the faith that was in their heart. We don't try to do works to get the, the blessing of God. But here's the point. Works are the outward display of my position in Christ. If I am in my position with Christ, then good works are going to be natural. Not something I have to work up. Amen. And in this year of multiplication, uh, expansion, multiplication, and increase, it's more important than ever that I keep these positional truths in line. Now, let me, let me finish with this. I know that there are Extreme doctrines. you got to understand, you can take any doctrine from this book and take it to the extreme. And I understand that. But let me, let me explain something to you. Faith is in the Bible. It's called the victory that overcomes the world. It's the substance of things hoped for. So no matter who takes faith and takes it to an extreme, we got to preach faith. Grace is in the Bible. That's how you're saved. There might be people that take grace and take it all the way over here to the extreme and teach things that the Bible doesn't teach about it, but we got to teach grace because it's in the Bible. You don't answer extreme doctrine with extreme doctrine. You answer extreme doctrine with the Word. You understand? That's how you answer it. Now, understand this. When the, when the prophets, the sons of the prophets, were making a stew, and this young man went and he got some, some gourds that were, that were poisonous, and he brought them and put them in, in the pot. And they cried out to the man of God and said, there's death in the pot. Notice what he did. The Bible says he went and got some, some, some flour. When you look at that, it's cornmeal. Just basic cornmeal. He took a handful of cornmeal and threw it in the pot. And said, now take it and feed everybody. You know what you're going to get here? Cornmeal. 
Nothing exotic. Nothing extreme. Cornmeal. Why? That'll keep you straight. Listen, the pendulum's going to swing. It's going to swing all the way over here, and it'll swing all the way over here, but eventually it'll come back in the middle. You just, you just keep believing your positional place in Christ. Let everybody else do what they want. There's, there's doctrine going around now that, that uh, we don't even have to pay attention to the four Gospels, that the only thing that's important is the Pauline epistles. Well, listen, the Pauline epistles were what was written to the church, but the whole Bible is for the church. Oh, how much Scripture? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So I need the four Gospels. I can't live there, but I need them. Amen. That's my master. This whole Bible is my master speaking. But people say, well, pastor, how do you answer that? Just like I did. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable. So that means that Genesis is profitable. Exodus is profitable. First and Second Samuel is profitable. It's examples. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, they were written for our example. That we shouldn't fall after the same example of unbelief. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Say out loud, I am in Christ. I, am in Christ. I, have, taken my place. I have taken my place. Far above. Far above. All, principality. all principality. All power. All, power. all, might. all might. And all dominion. All dominion. And I am, I am seated together. With Christ. With Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So now when somebody says, what does that predestination mean you know nobody's predestined for heaven and nobody's predestined for hell not in their fallen state when I get born again my home becomes heaven my destiny becomes the plans that he had for me my whole life and oh what plans they are can I, can I tell you something real quick before we go home I remember my father used to go, he used to go, I traveled with my, my dad in my formative years. Him and my mom were evangelists. Still are. And, uh, but he used to go every, well, I say every year, we would go to uh, uh, a church in Buffalo, New York. Now, Buffalo, New York, I don't like Buffalo, New York. It's a, 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 kind of a dirty, ugly city. But, the, the, but New York State is very beautiful, very beautiful state. And this pastor lived way outside the city in the country. And uh, he had a daughter that was about my age. I was probably nine, maybe ten, ten years old, I think I was, maybe nine. I don't remember. And all around his house, he had these, these wheat fields. And uh, the, the wheat was up. It was up, it was up high. And it was, it was brown. So it was getting close to harvest season. And me and his daughter, we would go out in that wheat. And, you know, I mean, you know, crawl around the wheat and... And I remember it was in, in the fall of the year, and it was just getting crisp and, and just beautiful. And uh, I remember being, like I said, around nine, maybe ten years old. And we were out there one day, and I don't know what happened to her. She went off on her own way. And uh, I just remember laying down in that wheat and looking up in the sky. And it was just blue. It was just beautiful. And I knew right then, God's got something for me to do with my life. And if, if I think about it long enough, I can still hear the wind blowing through that wheat and see it. Because that was the moment God impacted me with my destiny. That I knew I was going to do something for God. He didn't tell me that I was going to be pastoring a church. He didn't tell me I was going to be planting churches and going to other nations and, and raising up pastors and ministers. He didn't tell me that. But I knew right then, I'm marked by God. I've got something to do for God. And I look over my life, since I really got into the plan of God, I look over my life, there are no coincidences. Every step led to another step. Every direction led to another direction. When I think about coming to this church, you know, it was no coincidence that God had me where He had me. I was in a church as an assistant pastor. The power of God was moving. God was doing wonderful miracles. And let, let me tell you how this happened. Kevin's sitting back here, and 
Kevin at that time and, and his family came, meaning his mom and, and his, uh, some of his sisters. Remember when your, your sister's son got healed of all those allergies? Amen. Taking something like seven different allergy medications and God healed him instantly. But God, now here's why I'm telling you that. Kevin and, and his mom came, Sister, Sister Janet came, and uh, God was moving. Well, it just so happened that uh, she put me in touch with Kathleen. She called me and said, I think it'd be good if you come to this church in DeSoto. She said, now this is what they called Kathleen. And here's the piano player's number. <laughs> so I called the piano player. Now I'm being led by the Spirit. I wouldn't have called if the Spirit wasn't leading me. Now watch, I'd taken my place. Taking paths that were before ordained. It was not coincidence that I got a hold of her. It wasn't coincidence that I got a hold of the pastor. It wasn't coincidence that when I came to this church, the pastor was leaving. No, not you, the month I came to this church. You understand? Wasn't coincidence. That plan started before the world was. I begin to see it at 10 years old, 9, 10 years old. I knew I had something to do for God. Amen. Do you understand? Wasn't coincidence. It, wa it wasn't coincidence that at that time a board that was largely populated by people that necessarily didn't think that much of me Brought me to pastor this church. Amen. Wasn't coincidence. It was the plan of God. So here's the, the point. It's not coincidence that you're here. At some point you took your place in Christ. And when God began to deal with you to come to this church, it wasn't just you. It wasn't just because you like my good preaching, although it is good. But that wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't why. It was because somewhere in your life, the imprint of your destiny was put on your spirit by the finger of God. And it permeated your spirit. And it put you on a path to your destiny. My God. And that's why when you came to this church, you started seeing, I got something to do for God. I got a call of God on my life. God's got something for me to do. Whew, there's the glory. Praise God. It's not coincidence. So pastor, what do I keep doing? Keep following the plan. Keep following the path. Because there's going to be people in here, God speaks to you to plant a church. There's going to be people in here that God's going to tell you, this is what you need to do. One day your pastor will get up and say, we're going to plant a church in Argentina. And right here you'll feel, I'm, I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to go. And you won't know how to, you may not even speak the language. You may not even know the difference between taco and quesadilla. <laughs> but I'm supposed to go. Amen. Why? That's God's plan. Amen. And let me explain this to you. I'm not going to tell you how short the days are and what you do, you got to do quickly. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If God gives you the desire to do it and you're willing to do it, you got plenty of time to get it done. Just get after it. Amen. Just get after it. Amen. When, I, when I came to this place, what was expected of me was to fill the pulpit on Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. That's all that was expected of me. They didn't want me to do anything else. That's all you got to do. But this, this big destiny came in the door. Whew. 
You understand? And this drive to do what God told me to do. And the anointing begin to remove burdens and destroy yokes. Now how does God bring a guy to a church and give him the church? I don't mean the people in the church. I mean the church. I mean the building. How does he bring him there and put that in his name? And give him everything to do with the church? It's my destiny. That 4,830 square foot sanctuary is my destiny. It will surely come to pass. Because it's my destiny. I have seen it. I've experienced it. In my spirit, I've walked through the hallways. I've walked in the sanctuary. It is as real to me as the building that I'm standing in. As surely as the word of God is true, it shall come to pass. Because it's my destiny. It's your destiny. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, 